is now the time is now one o'clock call the committee back to order um, I'd like to welcome Sabine Dietz from uh, Climate Atlantic she's the executive director um, Ms. Dietz the way we'll function is you'll have uh, 20 minutes to make your presentation uh, followed by which we'll go through uh, 40 minutes of questions 10 minutes from uh, each party um, so with that being said, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, merci beaucoup. I thank you very much for inviting me to speak today to the committee. Um, I have provided all of you with a slide deck and I'll follow this up with more detailed notes after the presentation. Je vais faire ma présentation en anglais, mais je suis certainement capable de répondre en français si vous avez des questions en français. And I will simply um, speak to the number of slides that slide that I'm on. And I note, note that the note deck that I provided doesn't have the correct light slide number. So I'm hoping that you can still follow along. Um, so slide number two, I'll just briefly explain what Climate Atlantic is. Uh, Jeff Hoyt already mentioned Climate Atlantic this morning in his presentation. I'll talk about a recent report provided from Natural Resources Canada. I'll talk a bit about why adaptation is so important, and then I'll spend most of my time on some recommendations on what I think should be in the revised climate change action plan that you're deliberating on. Slide number three, please. So Climate Atlantic was created following a federal call for proposals in 2020. Um, this nonprofit, so we're a nonprofit organization, we were incorporated in, the, in June of 2021. And our really our overarching goal is to increase the capacity of Atlantic Canadians to use climate information protections and, and data to make informed decisions about climate change impacts. We provide a number of services based on user needs, uh, help access, access projections and information, but we also focus on capacity building and offer training and support. And all of this is not to replace existing initiatives, but it's really to uh, strengthen already existing initiatives and help them along and really basically build on what's already going on. Slide number four. This gives, provides a list of some of the services that we may provide. All of our services are focused on what is needed on the ground or by the stakeholders, by sectors, by agencies and by organizations. That, that could include, uh, it does include our website that's already live. It could include curated access to information, resources and projections. Uh, we identify needs across the region, what is needed to make better, better decisions based on climate change information. Slide number five. Mm -hmm. So going just briefly to the regional report on uh, the regional perspectives report that was just published in December uh, by Natural Resources Canada. I was one of the co-lead authors on this report and there's no, no surprise. It's not really about impacts um, or greenhouse gas emissions. It is really focused on adaptation action that has been going on in Atlantic Canada and a very concerted effort. There's, it's not, not a surprise. Um, that coastal um, issues are very high, uh, very highlighted, very much highlighted in this in this report. But so are health risks, indigenous perspectives, the challenges our, our resource economies face, and the approach to building uh, adaptive adaptive capacity. Something that Mr. Hoyt mentioned this morning as well: the need to build capacity to actually respond to those um, impacts. Next slide, please. And all of us know in all regions, and I've looked up uh, where the committee members are located in the province, all of, all of you have experienced some sort of climate change impacts, whether it is the St. John River floods in 2018, 2019, the continued threat from those rivers, the ice storm on the UK Peninsula in 2017, or the leftovers from, from the Hurricane Dorian on the southeastern shore in 2019. So, um, and then small events like droughts in my own area in, in Memon Cook in 2020. And then when thinking about what's to come, we just have to look at the massive floods and impacts that BC has seen. Now, we may not see the same kind of fire problems, wildfire problems, but we are at risk of similar um, precipitation events as BC has seen. And then, of course, more close to home, the road damages in Cape Breton and in Newfoundland Labrador, where the Trans-Canada Highway was actually cut off for, for a certain, num certain number of days. Next slide. So the report, um, I just want to make sure this report is just a snapshot in time. And if you do go there and read it, um, and the link is provided in my slide deck, um, it's, it refers to anything going on before 2019. Um, but very few updates after that, because it takes a lot of time to review expert review from um, external, external reviews, etc. 
Um, so it's a snapshot in time, and even since then, there's been a lot happening that's not included in the report. So all provinces, including New Brunswick, is really active on adaptation. But I should also highlight that since then, last summer in 2021, the most recent uh, international report on climate change was published, the International Panel on the IPCC International Panel on Climate Change, in its sixth report, very clearly stated that, that some of those um, some of those impacts that we will be seeing are uh, they are irreversible, and they will stay with us uh, for 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 a long time, millennia. And uh, one of them is global sea level rise. So, having said that, um, these reports, the International Panel on Climate Change reports, are always very conservative. That means they don't look really, they don't give you the worst case. They they basically present what they can, what they want to say, with almost you know, with pretty much certainty. So in that sense, adaptation is absolutely crucial and it has to be a priority. We're facing impacts, we're facing hazards that we need to deal with. Next slide, please. And so I want to look just briefly back on from my perspective, having been having worked in the province in, on adaptation since 2010, so for quite a while. Um, since the plan came in, your, 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 the current plan or the um, expired plan came into action, um, was, or was, was started to be implemented, there were 39 of the 118 actions that were um, focusing on adaptation or had other adaptation com components. So not very many. Um, the ETF and the Environmental Trust Fund and the Climate Action Fund, and I've just looked at the last two years of information that was published, only 30% of the funding was spent on adaptation. Um, I understand that. Um, adaptation is not as sexy as electric cars, not as sexy as um, solar panels, and there's no clear win. There is no win where we can say we've reduced greenhouse gas emissions by so and so many tons. Um, so it is a hard, a hard thing to measure, but we do know the impacts can be severe. It's also complex. Adaptation is complex, and it's often closely tied to many other climate actions. So in some cases, mitigation, mitigation actions, so reducing greenhouse gas emissions, is linked to adaptation. I'll get back to that a little bit. But really, we don't have a choice. Um, adaptation work needs to be scaled up significantly. We need to better understand the risks, um, better understand adaptation actions that make sense in the future and today. Uh, we need to mainstream it across all sectors, all institutions, and everywhere. So, so to really make headway with decisions on uh, with with decreasing our risk, the focus needs to be on making all systems and people stronger, more able to withstand impacts. That's really what resilience is, and that also includes paying attention to nature. Now, in terms of risk management, just referring to COVID, we've learned a lot about how we look at risk, how we manage risk, what our risk tolerance is, and that can be, in my opinion, applied to how we deal with uh, climate impacts. Next slide, please. So in our role at, as Climate Atlantic, um, we look at across the region at the needs, uh, grassroots needs. And when I say grassroots needs, I really mean everybody that's working on climate change um, adaptation. So on, on, on dealing with the impacts. And they're really pretty much the same. Um, there's always a need for provincial leadership. And this is not a surprise when it comes to regulations or to directions and directives. Adaptation can be very ex expensive, and I put there can be very expensive. Um, most of the real significant adaptation actions that we need to take are really expensive. So, for example, removing sewage treatment uh, facilities out of floodplains, that's millions of dollars per facility. There's a lot of infrastructure investment that is needed to reduce risk. Capacity in our region, although I know Mr. Hoyt mentioned that we've got quite significant capacity in some areas, I would still argue that the capacity is very limited. Um, we lack the people, we, well, we don't lack people overall, but we lack increased number of people, um, better knowledge and literacy around climate risk and adaptation. And there are a lot of investments that are also needed to build, a cap build up capacity continuously. Uh, most, most, most of us in the space recognize the advantages of collaboration, but lots remains to be done to break down silos. While we know a lot about impacts, there's so much we don't yet fully understand. What are the impacts to habitats and species on our fishery sector, on aquaculture in the long term? We always lag behind. It seems we never have access to the most relevant, act accurate, and up-to-date information. And if, it is, if this is accessible, it's often not in easily understandable formats. And I think all of us have come across that. Graphs or reports that you need an interpreter to actually go through. I already mentioned the lack of literacy around the impacts on climate change. What is the risk? What is resiliency? How do we increase it? And what, what are the adapt adaptation options that we have? 
And last, something that I've heard more and more uh, expressed is the need to link mitigation or the need to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions with adaptations. Those are silos that are often not useful and certainly not in municipalities. It's not an either or, whether we prioritize one over the other, both are absolutely essential. Next slide, please. So this is where I want to spend a bit of time in my presentation on the recommendations that um, I would like to bring forward to the committee uh, to be included in the revised plan. Um, and I think Mr. Hoy also mentioned it this morning, a provincial risk assessment, something that is either underway or has been done in other provinces. So we've done a lot of, New Brunswick has done a lot of local risk, risk assessments or risk assessments for certain sectors. So municipalities, a lot of municipalities have, have, have adaptation plans. That means that they have also done some sort of risk assessment to their infrastructure and, and, and community. There's some sectoral ones, but as a province, we have no comprehensive description or overview of where our risks lie. We know our Northumberland Strait coastline is at very high risk from coastal flooding and storm surges. What about drought? What about post-tropical storms? What about the agricultural sector or forestry? A comprehensive risk assessment would help us identify our weak areas and provide clarity and focus while at the same time functioning as an ed educational tool within government and outside. And this educational tool idea I've seen actually happening currently in Nova Scotia. That's exactly what is happening. A lot of education internally in government through a risk assessment process that they've been undertaking. The adaptation strategy. So again, many adaptation plans have been developed, especially in New Brunswick municipalities. And I congratulate the government on that, on supporting those and supporting that capacity and increased understanding and increased um, action on, ad on adaptation. That's great. But a comprehensive adaptation strategy for the province would identify priorities, key areas to work on, and it could follow the national adaptation strategy being developed and to be completed by the end of 2022. It would also help us in identifying a baseline and being able to report on progress and adaptation. I'm going to updated climate projections, which has also uh, been mentioned before. This is an essential tool to making good decisions and decisions that are accurate and up to date. And these up to date climate projections need to be scaled down for the province. So there's a process there involved that is that that takes time. But the reality is this is basic information and the province should commit to making those up-to-date projections available to the public on a regular basis in a form that can be easily understood, such as inland flood risk maps, coastal sea level rise maps, or temperature and precipitation projections, among others. Like I mentioned, it's basic information required to make good decisions. And I'm really looking forward to, for example, seeing the flood maps, maps currently being finalized by the department. I congratulate the department on working on these and hopefully getting them to, to the public very, very soon. This will be an excellent tool that is absolutely crucial and needed. We cannot function without those in terms of evaluating risk um, from climate change impacts. A climate lens, this is a little bit of a uh, terminology that, uh, that was, was started out by the federal government. The federal government already requires all large infrastructure projects funded by them to apply a so-called climate lens. What it means is simply that incorporating climate change considerations in all work and projects becomes part of operations, something we really should expand to all projects undertaken by the province or funded by the province. The na natural systems, and I think that was mentioned this morning as well, our natural systems are extremely important to our health and safety. For example, dunes and coastal wetlands provide buffers between the power of the ocean, which is extreme, and the people and their infrastructure. That role needs to be broadly recognized and acknowledged and natural solutions to climate change. A little bit of a buzzword, but it's internationally in, and nationally recognized that natural and naturalized adaptation approaches, such as living shorelines or naturalized stormwater management ponds, but also protected areas have multiple benefits, including those of reducing risks from climate impacts, such as recurring heavy rainfall events. There should be priority em emphasis placed on those approaches. Next slide, second slide on recommendations. Statements of public interest. I know the province is currently considering um, those statements. Land use planning is an extremely important tool to manage risk from climate change. And the fact is that it's really underused. The planned statements of public interest need to include strong directives that make sure that land use planning is based on risk and vulnerabilities. And it needs to include the identification of areas most at risk, as well as directives on using appropriate adaptation measures. Talking a little bit about the Climate Action Fund, as I mentioned before, um, out of the funding, um, about 30%, less than 30% has been spent on adaptation. So I suggest that adaptation can be very expensive, um, extremely expensive. 
and so more, more funds needs to be allocated to adaptation actions and projects. Collaboration across Atlantic Canada. There's some areas where common interests make it necessary to collaborate beyond our borders. Chiknek Tourismus is one of those, those instances, which is of significant economic importance to New Brunswick and indeed the rest of Canada. But there are other opportunities to collaborate across Atlantic Canada, and New Brunswick should be open and committed to those kinds of collaboration. And I would I would mention here that, of course, Climate Atlantic is the is the um, outcome of such a collaboration among the provinces and the federal government. Education capacity building, also something that I believe was mentioned this morning. There has been a lot of effort spent on that. And New Brunswick the government has taken continued advantage of opportunities um, that are provided nationally to support climate change literacy efforts, as well as building ca capacity in, in specific sectors, like for example, planners, engineers, um, forest managers. There's so much more to do in this area on adaptation. We need capacity to understand climate change projections, how to use them, how to interpret them, how to assess risk and what to do about it. Education capacity building for grassroots adaptation practitioners including, for example, municipalities, nonprofit organizations, and others, will need to remain a high priority. And in terms of high-risk areas, so we have specific areas that are at high risk from climate change impacts, um, such as from flooding, erosion, and those need to be identified as high risk. We've got to be straightforward on this. We have to find a way of identifying those high-risk areas, and development in those areas should no longer be permitted. Understanding that this may not be a palatable approach, then at least municipalities need to be enabled to prohibit certain developments in the highest risk areas. This should include the development of policies or clear provincial directives on moving vulnerable infrastructure out of those high risk areas, which is generally called relocation. This is something that fall really well into the, the other need of protecting our coastal, infrastructure, our coastal systems, for example, which are natural buffers to coastal storm surges and sea level rise. And lastly, I would suggest to implement a Climate Change Advisory Council. Uh, climate Change Advisory Council would be a tool to help map out actions across sectors and regions based on expert advice and input. These advisory bodies have proven themselves in the past and pl can play a critical ro role in helping to identify priorities, test ideas, use the brain power of our province has, and making sure there is broad buy-in for actions. And that's all, that's the presentation. Um, and I welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move to our uh, question component. Uh, each party again has uh, 10 minutes and uh, we'll start with the official opposition. Je ne sais pas qui va commencer. Madame Landry, vous avez la parole. Madame Landry, je pense que vous êtes. Euh, je vous entends pas. She, she's on mute. Yeah, she's uh, yeah, you're going to need to unmute. Yes, sorry about that. Désolé. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Désolé pour. Euh, <laughs> J'ai changé d'endroit de travail. Oh, ouais. euh, donc, merci pour la présentation. Euh, C'est très intéressant ce que vous faites. Euh, you know, I, I'm looking at that, uh, uh, your presentation, and certainly this is something that uh, can complement uh, any government uh, or, you know, we need more information, and that's probably or mainly what you're doing. Um, so you've been in operation since 2021. Am I correct with that? Yes, correct. Okay. And you're financed through fi uh, federal and provincial um, funding. Also correct, yes. Okay. Uh, and how many people who work at the uh, at the Sackville office? And it, do you have plans on growing uh, uh, growing your uh, your team? Yes, so maybe I should just explain very briefly uh, what, how we operate. We operate virtually. I'm located in Sackville, but my team is across Atlantic Canada, so from Newfoundland okay. to, yeah. Um, we're we're currently a team of eight. We're going to grow it to at least eight, to at least two more or one or three more. 
Um, there's a core team that works directly for me and that is paid through our operations. And then there's one provincial specialist um, that will be located in each of the Atlantic provinces, um, potentially also an additional one in Labrador, to establish that very close link with provincial government, um, because that's a very critical uh, relationship that we'll work, we're, we'll, we're incorporating into our operations. So a small team, um, but already this year we have hired two interns that are working with us, and that's also the plan to continue. And as a need arises, we will build capacity, but we're not planning to become a massive um, organization. So we're really here to support all the others that are already working in this space and are very active in the various provinces. Okay. And, and did you put in place that your organization uh, following uh, government ask or is it coming from private industries or where is it coming from is it an opportunity for uh, um, is it government or industry uh, focus so this is a government led and I think uh, Mr. Hoyt this morning mentioned that climate change adaptation work had started in roughly in 2010 in the province and so um, uh, and the first three years of this kind of work I was also involved at that time um, in this work and even coming out of this work there was a need established to have something that continues across Atlantic Canada and provide services so it's been a little while um, but the provinces have worked with the federal government on, on establishing a framework for this organization other organizations like similar to this exist across Canada um, in not in all places but British Columbia uh, the the, uh, the prairie provinces Quebec um, and and so and we're we're one of these this network of, of organizations across Canada now um, it is a government initiatives initiative um, and this organization came into being as uh, after a um, competitive call for proposals um, that the federal government issued but that was collaboratively developed with the four Atlantic provinces and what's the most requested services that uh, that you offer yeah. um, so at this stage so we officially launched in, launched in December um, but like I mentioned we've met already with hundreds of people across Atlantic Canada our pride this time is still the network so yesterday we had an event for uh, staff or uh, coordinators that work with municipalities across Atlantic Canada to see what their needs are so we're still in the process of identifying those needs but currently we respond to any request that we get from across Atlantic Canada for um, anything related to adaptation climate information climate projections and so on so we'll try to point people where where they go but we're still in the in the what what is actually needed um, you know so we're still in the in the in that phase Um, strong, strong engagement focus, sorry. OK. Est-ce que vous êtes une organisation qui, euh, à travers lesquelles le, les entreprises ou euh, les organisations à but non lucratif peuvent passer pour aller chercher des fonds? Euh, non. Non. Nous autres, on ne donne pas les fonds, mais nous autres, on peut aider à trouver des fonds. Alors, nous autres, on a déjà entendu parler que les gens ont besoin euh, de l'information où se trouvent les fonds. Puis des fois, c'est partout un peu. Um, il y a toujours des nouvelles op options ou opportunités. Puis nous autres, on, est, on, est, on, va, on va faire certain que sur notre site web, il y en a un endroit où les gens peuvent aller, aller chercher l'information sur où est-ce qu'on peut euh, chercher des fonds pour du travail de, de, pour, sur l'adaptation. OK. Est-ce que vous travaillez en collaboration? Vous avez mentionné qu'il y a un réseau euh, dans d'autres provinces canadiennes. Euh, les changements climatiques n'ont pas de frontières nécessairement. Est-ce que vous travaillez, euh, parce qu'on est quand même aussi euh, voisins euh, avec le Québec, avec le Maine, est-ce que vous avez établi ou avez l'intention d'établir euh, des relations euh, de proximité avec euh, ces organisations-là? Oui, on les, on les a déjà, parce que nous autres, on est un réseau, puis on se rend compte euh, euh, assez régulièrement puis on travaille très étroitement parce que, euh, parce que nous autres, on fait partie de cette réseau-là. Il faut travailler avec eux autres. Alors oui, certainement, avec, à, à travers le, le pays. Puis certainement okay. aussi Uranos, qui est l'autre organisme qui existe au Québec, euh, même sorte d'idée que nous autres. Oui, on travaille avec eux autres aussi. Okay. Um, uh, how much funding is provided by the province and the federal government? And it, Are there any strings attached to those to that funding? Um, so 
this, I don't, I'm not sure about the exact amount, but it's about $560,000 per year from the federal government. And we're also supported with a, with a grant um, for operations from, the, from each provincial government. Um, and the provinces themselves also fund those provincial specialists that are part of our team. So there's an additional funding, and I don't know how much that exactly is, um, but there's this additional funding uh, pot that the province uh, has worked out with the federal government in some way that I'm not privy to entirely, but yes, so definitely funded by both. And that funding is guaranteed until for the next uh, almost three years. And uh, on the recommendation sites that you're providing us, um, what would be your three top priorities? <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Um, you know, it, it's that that's a tough question. It really is a tough question. Um, you know, I've thrown in, I haven't thrown in, I really thought about this very carefully. The, um, the adaptation strategy and adaptation plan, um, they're not really necessarily actions, but they're, we're almost, we're almost at a stage where we need, where we need both of those to reflect back on what we've done, where we've come from and where we're going. Um, because there's so much that's gone on, but even I can't keep track of where we're at on certain aspects. So these are sort of basic ones. But um, to me at this stage, what I'm really most urgently pushing for is, is the updated uh, and regionally scaled climate projections um, and presenting them in a really easy to understand manner. Um, you know, let me put the, the risk assessment, the adaptation strategy in one, and then the regionally scaled climate projection in the other one, and then I'll put the high risk areas in my third one, because I think there is a very strong liability a case to be made uh, when we don't identify clearly those high risk areas and people continue to develop and build. We're actually putting municipalities, we're putting individuals, we're putting the province at risk, um, not just from being sued, but this is really about lives, right? Um, so I think there is a, there's a case to be made for that. And um, I know this is not easy. I know this is going to be really complicated if it's implemented, but it is something that I feel we really need. We really require at some point and sooner rather than later. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, very quick question. Um, do you work with, we, you work with other provinces, obviously, the Atlantic provinces, is there, is that equally distributed, uh, the time uh, that you spend on each of the provinces, or is, I don't know how to say that, but since everybody's putting in some money, um, do you allocate uh, uh, your time on, on the base of uh, the money that they uh, allocate to your organization? All right, so I, I just want to go back to what I mentioned that there, there is, there is, will be, or is already a provincial specialist in each province, and because they're integrated in our team, that really makes sure that the focus um, is there for each province, for 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 the needs in each province. So our organization is really there externally to support everybody else as well as the provinces. So the provincial specialists provide that. Um, very concentrated focus on, let's say, New Brunswick or Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia. So I would say we're not keeping track of who we're working with, but we're including at this stage because we're still working on the needs assessment. We're including province uh, across Atlantic region. When we're talking with municipalities right now, it's with all of them or with, you know, coordinators in municipalities. We're talking with all of them, not, not yet with provincial, you know, uh, um, organizations. So hopefully once all the provincial specialists are in place, this will be really pretty much even out across the provinces where the needs are there needs to be um, time spent thank you very much you're welcome i'll say uh mr kuhn was a very deep minute thank you mr chair and good afternoon Ms. Dietz. thank you for your presentation and your very specific Recommendations. I can't tell you how delighted I am to learn that uh, uh, now in our region uh, we have Climate Atlantic. Um, it's exactly the kind of uh, institutional capacity we've needed for some time. Over the years, uh, an equivalent organization in Quebec, Uranus, uh, has been called on by the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers to brief them regularly, uh, back when I used to attend those meetings uh, annually. And I thought at the time, boy, it would be great to have something like that 
uh, in Atlantic Canada, because we need to collaborate together within our region. Um, I'm a strong proponent of the idea that if we don't hang together, we're going to hang alone. So uh, this is really, really encouraging. Um, I had a, a few questions I wanted to ask. One is, uh, with respect uh, to the Council of Atlantic Premiers, uh, will you be briefing them at their next uh, regular, regularly scheduled meeting? Uh, if I get a request, by all means. So um, any province just needs to request um, us to provide a briefing to wherever they want. This is our role is to be of service to the provinces as well. Great. Thanks for uh, letting me know about that. Um, I wanted to ask some questions on your recommendations. So with respect to the, the, the idea or the recommendation for uh, undertaking a New, a New Brunswick climate risk assessment, uh, who, who would be the lead for that? Who would you recommend be the lead in making that happen? Well, um, you know, it, it could be done in different ways. I mean, I, you likely will need some consultants to, to support that work. There, there is no question in my mind, but I think it's the adaptation um, group in, in the, at the Department of Environment, Climate, uh, Environment and Climate Change, no, Environment and Local Government uh, in the Climate Change Secretariat, just because there is uh, the most of the exp expertise is in that team. Um, and it will have to draw on many other um, departments as well, Department of Health, Department of Social Development, because it should also include issues like social vulnerability in there, you know, not just um, impacts directly from the hazards, but, you know, wh where are our vulnerable people, where are our vulnerable infrastructure. So it, it complicated should be coordinated by government, uh, but likely with aspects that can be um, contracted out, subcontracted. Um. Are there, well, so do any of the other Atlantic provinces uh, have climate risk assessments completed or underway right now? Yes, um, Newfoundland, I, I haven't seen it, but I know it's completed. Um, Prince Edward Island just completed theirs, um, and I think it's public. I should have checked that. Uh, Nova Scotia is in the process of completing theirs. So there's quite a bit of um, expertise in the region already on how to do this, um, what's good to include, what are the challenges with some of the processes, um, you know, when you start including social vulnerability indices um, in the process um, complicates things and what kind of variables you want to include. But some really interesting uh, work being done, um, finished in um, Nova Scotia currently and the Prince Edward Island. We had a presentation from Prince Edward Island about theirs. Very interesting process. Very good that's examples. That, that's excellent. So we should be able to hit the ground running to, when we launch this, which uh, based on that, I'm glad to hear it. Um, I know that uh, nationally, the Canadian, the federal government is, uh, uh, has already launched a development of the Canadian adaptation strategy. Um, there is a nice write-up in the Globe and Mail on January 11th um, for anyone who can access it online uh, these days. Um, and uh, in it, it described uh, their, their intent is to have something finished by the end of the year, before the end of the year, when they've developed it, divided it up into five advisory tables, uh, one dealing with health, one dealing with infrastructure, one dealing with nature, one dealing with economy, and one doing with, dealing with disaster response. So that's kind of how they framed up adaptation priorities in those five areas, uh, themed areas. Um, are, are you or anyone else associated with Climate Atlantic, are you part of any of the advisory tables that have been established by the federal government? So not of the advisory tables, but because we're part of the Canadian Center of Climate Services network of service centers, um, from my understanding, once the tables have done their initial work, we will be part of the engagement process. We as network of centers, because we're obviously a logical place to go um, to actually, you know, have, have a specific engagement component. So that's my hope. I have talked to some of the organizations that participate in the in these tables. So I'm in contact and we've had presentations at uh, our regional, our, sorry, our Canada wide meetings of the network on the national adaptation strategy process. Yeah, okay, well, that's good because it's important, of course, that the national strategy be informed by, by experience on the ground uh, in places. And, and certainly before the sort of recent uh, spate of, of what I call unnatural disasters in BC in the last year, certainly I, I would hazard to say that Atlantic Canada um, between 2010 and 2020 had um, more or as many as some other parts of the country of, of unnatural disasters spread out over time, starting widely recognized, I think, starting with the, 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 deluge, the December deluge of, uh, of rain in the 
House traded in Western Charlotte County in 2010, and the headlines uh, around that acknowledged that what we were seeing was a consequence of uh, our destabilizing climate, and just continued from there uh, 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 with with unnatural storms and uh, and disasters in the in the region. And if you've lived through any of that, uh, it is um, stressful, uh, and things happen that you would never imagine could happen. A babbling brook beside a friend's house ends up looking like a, a raging river surrounding the house, threatening to carry it off into into the over the bank into the bay. You know that that happened. <laughs> it didn't carry it away, but but that's how they ended up. Spent a terrible night while that was happening. Another friend's house got moved off of its foundations. Other people had never seen any flooding in their uh, their 125 year old farmhouses through the generations, and uh, that caused flooding because the, round, the ground the groundwater or the water table came up so immense. It was uh, extraordinary. People blocked from getting into their homes. People blocked from uh, because of road closures as the asphalt was carried away. Uh, so, the I guess uh, I, I guess it speaks to. Uh, I guess my concern a little bit here is we haven't done the New Brunswick climate risk assessment or a New Brunswick adaptation strategy and the federal one is kind of galloping ahead. Um, so uh, do, do, do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Is that a, is that a problem or, or is that all right? I think that I think that's that's okay. I mean, I think it will be informed by some of the regional experiences and expertise for sure, like the national one I mean, but it'll also outline sort of a framework within which New Brunswick can place its own adaptation strategy. So it is not, it's, you could see it both ways. It's backwards. It should be informed by the grassroots, which, which, which in this case are the regions or the provinces, territories. But the fact is that it'll be high level. It won't be as detailed as you would expect a provincial one would be, or as, you know, pointing to areas, specific areas as the provincial ones will be. So I think it'll, it'll work out, it'll work, work out fine. And it actually give the province, um, uh, it, something to look at. There will be there will be items in there that are really important for New Brunswick to incorporate in its adaptation strategy. It will make all the difference for, let's say, funding, um, you know, funding of infrastructure projects. Things will change once the adaptation strategy, the federal adaptation strategy, is is approved. Um, it, it will likely change in terms of how New Brunswick can access funding from the federal government. I'm asking you how we should treat the dike works facing the Bay of Fundy in southeastern New Brunswick. What what should be done to to strengthen them or ensure that they don't uh, let the Bay of Fundy in? Well, my simple comment is get on with it. It's like, um, you know, I, I live in Sackville, so, and I've known about this for the last 12 years now. Um, uh, you know, it's, um, plus I, I did work on the, on the first assessment of adaptation options for the chick neck isthmus. It's one of those national, really na of national concern, infrastructure pieces of national concern. So, um, there's a lot of work that will need to be done. This is this is millions and millions of dollars that that you know 50 million go across there. I think on a daily basis, but it's millions and millions of dollars of investment that that need to be um, put here, put put in that region in, into the dikes, one way or another, whatever the options are. So my my point is, it's urgent. <laughs> Get on with it. Um, all of those large infrastructure pieces, uh, transportation infrastructure, they need to be looked at as a priority, especially if they link Canada to or provinces to other areas in Canada. We've seen what supply chain interruptions can do. We, we are, we're currently already living them. So that's my comment. Well, thanks. That, that makes me think. I hope, I hope that what flows out of the national adaptation strategies, the pan-Canadian uh, plan that includes federal provincial funding arrangements, because the, the scale of the the investments are going to be large, uh, but absolutely necessary and urgent, uh, as we've seen already in New Brunswick, given the damage that, that's occurred so far. And that's um, that's nothing like what we, as scientists, predict we're going to see in the future. So um, I fi finally, I want to ask you about uh, the Climate Change Fund. And uh, um, in terms of that adaptation, do you see a way of, I'm not going to ask for your priorities, but how to frame up the priorities? What, what kind of lens should be used to to prioritize funding from the Climate Change Fund for adaptation? 
Yeah, I think we're, so I should maybe mention, so in the, from the Environmental Trust Fund, a lot of funding has gone into the capacity building piece. So, you know, to nonprofit organizations, to municipalities and so on, so which is great, great, which are the smaller non-infrastructure pieces. But the Climate Action Fund, uh, the, yes, Action Fund um, has the opportunity of uh, doing some, some pilot work, some larger pilot work that currently can't be done. And some municipalities have already done some of this pilot work on their own. And it's really complicated. And I think you'll hear from SACWA later on today from the CEO from SACWA about that. It's really complicated, really expensive, but these kind of things need to happen. We need to figure out how we can do those things better. What kind of things actually make sense? And the Climate Action Fund, I think, is an opportunity to invest in those. Um, um, you know, there's so much to be invested in. You'll never, currently you don't have the funding to cover all the infrastructure investments that are required across the province to make them climate uh, resilient or climate safe or withstand the climate impacts. It's just not their money is not there. So focus on at least the high risk areas or the areas and in infrastructure that we know we need to figure out what to do with it as a priority. And as you said, the climate Thank risk you, is Mr. Mr. Kuhn, that, uh, con that concludes your time. Mr. Austin, nice to see you. Uh, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I want to uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Deitz, for being here and presenting uh, on behalf of the Climate Atlantic uh, organization. Um, in the uh, information from, from what uh, has been presented, I know there's a lot of discussion, uh, or I guess um, data that you deal with in relation to flooding and storm surges, erosion, drought, low water levels, etc. And I'm just curious, um, from your organization's perspective, is is government or provincial regulations, are they sufficient when it comes to development uh, near flood zones? Is the regulations, in your opinion, um, are they adequate in, in, in relation to some of the uh, climate change that we're seeing in, in relation to flooding? Mm. Um, and that's a categorical no, and that goes for the entire region that we cover, that Climate Atlantic covers. Um, so th there are there there are pieces I think um, where um, you have two sides to the to, to the to the picture here. You've got um, regulations that could directly prohibit, and I mentioned that that could directly prohibit building in flood risk areas. You know the flood zones, the flood plains, um, coastal areas, and so on. You could implement regulations. This is usually a really hard thing to do, or you could enable municipalities and and, or, and communities to actually prohibit this. Um, but currently, um, I'm sorry, but the, we build in high risk areas. And even if we have development restrictions on those high risk areas, you know, we say you can build higher, you can be, build on stills in flood risk areas. That is not sufficient. You're still putting people at risk. Um, so I think um, this is a little bit of a, a, a chicken and an egg thing because, you know, I mentioned that in, that education still needed and literacy is still needed about risk because when we talk to people about risk, well, are you really, they may be really aware yeah i'm building in an area that i've seen the maps um you know there is a risk in uh, of a certain level of frequency of a storm surge i'm just going to build on stilts um it, that is a limited level of understanding of risk and it's a very high risk tolerance but i'm not even sure that people who do this who are still built as individuals in there understand um, the risk that 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 they're actually in, and they're putting others in as well. And I'm saying, sure, you can you can decide for yourselves that you don't want to wear a mask when you go out in the in the in the you know this discussion that we've had with COVID. You don't want wear a mask when you go out in the store in the store and you put yourself at risk. But the reality is, we all know you're not just putting yourself at risk. So. The same thing goes for flood risk areas. If I build in a flood risk area on stilts, I may be safe through some sort of flood event, not all of them by any means. And there could be different kinds that, no, this is not gonna work, but I maybe feel safe enough. And yet I have to get the first responders out to my place when I'm isolated in a flood event, putting their lives at risk, their health at risk, right? Um, putting my own my own health at risk um, and others through maybe a septic field that I have under in the ground that may be, um, you know, uh, putting uh, septic um, fluid out in the water that's surrounding my building. So it's not a simple conversation. It's not a simple understanding of risk. And so regulations, I consider, they're needed when you just can't get people to the point where their risk assessment is correct. 
for all of us, for municipal governments and for provincial governments and federal governments, a big part of functioning is risk, is risk management. And so I think this is a really, there is a really a need for concerted conversations around risk management around high risk areas in our province, areas that um, maybe in some you need to entirely prohibit development. And that's a level of, you know, political comfort. But it is, in my mind, we need to put political comfort or political um, questions aside and really think about risk as risk to life, risk to the public, risk to others, risk to infrastructure, instead of thinking, well, we shouldn't do that because we may lose tax dollars, which is, I have heard, and this is the same across Atlantic Canada, it's often a consideration that's first in mind, and it's not risk that's first in mind when we look at um, managing development in high-risk areas. I, I appreciate that. I, I know, um, and I've said earlier that uh, my writing of uh, Fredericton Grand Lake uh, takes in a lot of high risk uh, flood areas. And I, you know, I was quite involved in the uh, 2018 flood in my area where I saw a lot of the homes that were just devastated. And uh, looking back, a lot of those people, I think on their own have uh, changed course. You know, if we're talking about a cottage, instead of rebuilding a cottage, they simply uh, bought a, a fifth wheel trailer. And they'll put that in, take it out in the fall, put it back in the spring type of thing and to, to mitigate some of their own personal risk with that. Uh, but on the other hand, I see other places where they simply done, like you said, they put them on stilts or they've built up uh, to try to mitigate some of the effects. Um, and, and I would suspect there would be a considerable difference between uh, the risk associated with coastal areas uh, in relation to the ocean versus risk associated with uh, you know areas around lakes. Is there is there a significant change between the two in terms of development and what regulations should be put in place for those? Um, so I, I I probably wouldn't distinguish between coastal or inland because you know when you think back about there and I, again I don't remember the year because like uh, Mr. Kuhn has has mentioned there have been so many events and there have been so many events across Atlantic Canada. But Batch and Newfoundland at some point in the past experienced a rain uh, event in the winter and everything froze up. So you got houses that were flooded and then they were frozen up right immediately. So there were pictures of, of cars in, you know, halfway covered, so basically iced in. So I wouldn't say necessarily there's a difference between coastal and inland, but there's a difference between the uses that you want to um, put in areas of high risk. So if I've got a high risk area um, that that you know I want to have a ball field in, um, or some other such 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 uh, development that's really, I would say um, low risk to people and infrastructure. If you lose the ball field, if it's underwater or iced up um, for you know even two weeks, as was the case um, in in your area, um, it's not a big deal. You do that to a hospital, that's entirely like first and it's an entirely different question. So, and that's why I'm sort of hesitant about the regulations. I think there need to be regulations, but mm, it, it's it's not a matter of some, simply saying no to high risk areas. It's a very nuanced approach to it. It's a nuanced approach in that it depends on what kind of views you want to have of the area, more so than whether it's coastal or inland. So depending on use um, that you're planning to have. Agricultural areas, for example, the type that the, the behind the dike lands in the Tantamar area, they can be flooded. They need just some fresh water to wash out the salt and they'll be good to go again. Um, you know, but if 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 there is any further development, um, such as you know, the Champlain place in Moncton is in a floodplain, um, was built in a floodplain. Developments like that are a different matter altogether. That's that those are high risk areas, right? and yeah, high, risk, high risk developments for sure yeah <clears throat> no that that makes sense I, I appreciate that answer um just switching gears a little bit in relation to um <clears throat> i know uh your organization or i understand your organization deals with flooding storm surges erosion things that, that we, we had discussed earlier um i'm wondering do, do you do any work in relation to uh forest fires like if, if we look at droughts or uh um, you know, uh, other things that would impact, whether it's disease or infestations that would re relate to forest. Does your organization do any work in relation to potential for forest fires or data collected from climate and how it may affect forest fires or potential forest fires? Okay, so um, 
we don't do direct work. When when I refer to what we do, our work is, so we've met, for example, with the Canadian Forestry Service in Fredericton um, to discuss, well, what kind of data sets do they have? What kind of work are they doing? And how can we be of help in making all of that information available? So we're really looking around and seeing, well, who has done what and what is out there that we can actually somehow provide to the end users, the people who actually need it, the organization agencies and so on that need it. So one thing that I can give you as an example, one, one has been brought up to us is wind, um, the wind regimes, the changing wind regimes and how will that influence offshore uh, oil and gas production like the, the you know, in, in Newfoundland um, or uh, wind regimes changing for the fishing industry or aquaculture industry. So those are things that we're, we're actually currently, I don't know where, where it is. We, we haven't found, we don't quite know yet. We're looking where those data sets are and who's doing research on what. That's our role. Our role is figuring out what is there, where is it, how can we make it more available, easier accessible. That's just what I described, you know, easily understandable information. And if something is missing, then we find somebody who does the work to provide that information if, it, if it's really needed. So we will do that work and seeing, okay, who's doing research? Can we maybe have a project with that research on figuring out ABC, you know, where it's invasive species or species pests for, for forestry. But I think that work has been, I think at least partially done. So our work is that intermediary facilitator looking for, um, and then being sort of the conduit through which this kind of information can be, can go out to whoever needs it. So you, you folks collect the data, it's up to each organization to how they use the data to develop policy, regulations, that sort of thing, correct? We do not collect data. Um, okay. We look for where and who has collected the data. And okay. then we help the user uh, use the data. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Austin. Okay, members of the government side, uh, Minister Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Ms. Dietz. It's been uh, very informative. I've just got a couple of, of things uh, on my little list here. Um, is the chief mission of your organization singularly to make recommendations, or do you also have the capacity to assist with the development and implementation of strategy? Um, so we're not even really necessarily making recommendations. Um, we help, we help um, organizations, agencies, municipalities, individuals, um, figure out what they need in order to make better decisions. So, so let's say you're building a house and you want to know, well, okay, I don't know whether my house is in an area that's at, of high risk for flooding and you don't know where to go. You may contact Climate Atlantic and you, you'll say, do you, do you know where I can find flood risk maps? Are there any? Do you know, um, how can I find out if my property or the property that maybe I want to buy is at risk and we can help you find that. And then if you don't know how to read the information that, you, that you've accessed, then we can help you interpret that information. And if you're looking for ideas, okay, how do I make my property safer? Um, we'll help you figure out where is that information? You know, is there an organization in your region, provincial government, agency or individuals at the provincial government who can actually help you um, to uh, to develop those options for your property. So it's again, it's this, um, you know, I was asked to, to provide an input into um, the review of the plan. That's why it's called recommendations. And this comes also partially out of my experience or expertise in the province. But um, Normally, we may be much more general in making recommendations. So I may tell you, well, you should, if you're buying a house, if somebody approaches me, if you're buying a house, you should at least look at uh, whether you're in a flood risk zone. That's your minimum, you know, whether you're coastal, you're in a flood risk zone or inland, whether you're in a flood risk zone. Again, with the upcoming flood maps, our role as Climate Atlantic, the, the flood mapping that the province is, um, is, is going to publish, our role as Climate Atlantic will, will, will be that we'll help um, individuals or organizations, agencies look at the maps and see what do they actually mean, how can I read it, and how can I interpret it. That's what our role will be. So more on that and then making recommendations. Um, and, you know, when, when you're looking for adaptation options or recommendations, how do I adapt my house? How do I adapt my infrastructure? Then, again, we'll find people who can help you with that. Okay, great. There's, there's many organizations across the province that do that. Great. Um, I appreciate your your uh, your line about uh, uh, natural sol providing natural solutions. As you can appreciate, with the uh, being in the Department of Agriculture, we've got a lot of inland um, issues with with streams and rivers, and we also have the the coastal issues in the Chignecto area. 
Um, so I appreciate your looking, but as, while we applaud what the federal government is doing with their climate action, I think you can agree with me that the ETF application process for Joe Public is very labor intensive and you almost need to have a professional grant writer to, to uh, perform the application process. Is there any, in your capacity as, I'm going to use the translator uh, capacity in terms of interpreting what, what is being done. Is there an opportunity for you to assist um, Joe Public, who's fit, trying to do these environmental uh, trust fund applications to uh, provide mitigation or, or adaptation to their property in a natural form? Are you able to do that? So I'm going to be very cautious about this. One of the things um, is that, uh, let's say, speaking especially about agriculture, right, because there's a lot of opportunities for natural solutions. You mentioned streams, you mentioned erosion control, um, fantastic opportunities in the in agriculture. It's And agriculture is one of the places where uh, adaptation mitigation can really overlap. So so the management of lands, um, you know, retaining um, carbon in the soil, really great opportunities in agriculture at the same time. Um, you know, reducing runoff from agriculture um, operations. So um, I, I'm sort of hesitant about it because the Environmental Trust Fund traditionally doesn't provide funding to individuals that want to do work on their properties. However, you know, we've got um, agricultural associations in this province that assist farmers, in, in, I'm just mentioning farmers, um, mm -hmm. um, in the work they do. So I'm just thinking about the Canopy Cases Watershed Association in, in the Sussex area who helps uh, restoring shorelines uh, in, in agricultural areas to reduce runoff, to reduce flood risk, because that's what it also does. Um, so, and the Canopy Cases Watershed Association does receive Environmental Trust Fund and uses the Environmental Trust Fund to do that kind of work which is excellent. So this is normally the path. And so if we would get approached, if I would get approached by a, by a farmer or by a, what do you call it, Joe Public or Jane Public, um, yes. I, would, I would say, um, okay, so if you're in Sussex, I'd say, um, why don't you talk to the Kennedy Cases Watershed Association um, and ask them what they can do to help you. And, you know, watershed associations cover most of our province. It's a, they're an ex excellent access point for any individuals if they think they have a project that they want to embark on. And many of them work on, uh, on rehabilitating waterways, you know, protecting the shorelines and so on and so on. Another one is the Nashwalk Watershed Association, very active. But um, I think, uh, I forget now, I saw a stat the other day about how much, how, what the percentage is of watersheds that are covered by watershed organizations. So that's where I would go. Contact the local organization, work with them, see if your project works, if, if they have an idea that helps you in, with your idea, um, and then let them apply for the, for the funding that's available and out there. So your organization would be a great starting point for folks? Sure. Great. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister Crosman. Yes, thank you very much. How much time is left, sir? <clears throat> Couple we have, minutes? Uh, we have four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. It's a great presentation. Lots of information being shared. I really appreciate that. And certainly looking forward to working closely with the Environment, Climate Change, uh, and your group <clears throat> with Climate Atlantic. A um, couple questions, I guess. Uh, we are here today and this week next to come up with what I've heard. <clears throat> Can you please summarize? I'm trying to take notes here the top two or three items of what we can take back from this meeting today uh, with Climate Atlantic and how we can help work together? Um, so so I think I think um, you're already doing that, Mr. Crossman, through, through Climate Atlantic. I mean, we are part of the department's or provincial government's um, initiative to collaborate with the other provinces. And I think, um, you know, uh, continued collaboration, working together. Um, I have good relationships with, with the department, with your adaptation team. Um, so just continuing what we're already doing, really building capacity and helping each other and working well together. I think that's, um, yeah. So okay. well, thanks we're much. already on a good path. <laughs> no, I, I believe we are as well. Just the door is always open for sure. <clears throat> Regard to communication, how do we get people on board to let them know about you and your operation and how we can all work together uh, regard to our concerns for climate change. 
Yeah, so we, we have actually, I have, we, we have a team member who is specifically allocated to communication outwards across Atlantic Canada. So website, we use social media. <clears throat> And um, you know, as as we as the provincial specialist for New Brunswick um, is 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 being hired, which hopefully should be sh soon, we'll definitely work more on just making sure everybody knows that we're there. Um, I mean, remember we just launched in December, so we're fairly new, but our newsletter currently has already 800 um, subscribers, which you know, between December the 17th or whatever, and now that's that's sub substantial. So. You know, we can both, the idea is that we both promote what the provincial governments are doing and their resources and tools um, and actions, as well as the provincial government, you know, pointing people towards us when there's things that, that the provincial government thinks um, we could cover instead of the provincial government individual. So it's, it's going to be a mutual collaborative approach to uh, filling the need of education, uh, capacity building, um, resourcing, etc. Sure, I do. We appreciate that as well as Minister Johnson mentioned uh, we're well aware of the uh, Nashwalk watershed, Ken McCase's watershed as well with uh, Ben Well and his group. We've been there and all the concerns of the inland. Uh, I know we're talking about the erosion on the, on the coastline here, but the farmers' fields and whatnot. And they've done some great work up there. And uh, the Choke Creek area, Sussex in particular, the, uh, you know, the, the spring freshets certainly take out some of their property, which they don't want to lose. So it's my understanding as well that we have a, a member sitting from our department on your board of directors. Is that right? Or, or will be soon. I realize it's just starting in December. Correct. So that's a great opportunity, too, to keep the communication open. And uh, any other plans for communication, bringing the public on board through social media, post, or public announcements, or what's your best venue for uh, media? Um, social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, um, our website will be <clears throat> the one portal hopefully that we'll use. But then whenever we can do something collaboratively with the government, like the launch was, for example, collaboratively yeah. organized with the federal government and all provincial governments, then we, you know, we do cross um, the postings, etc. So, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Okay. One last note, there's a minute left here. Uh, what is your final word you'd like to take back today from, from this meeting today? Uh, uh, regarding yeah, so, moving ahead. Yeah, moving ahead. I think take. I know you, were, uh, you yeah, mentioned take, adaptation. Yes. So taking adaptation more seriously and looking at it from a risk management lens and looking at it from um, a, a high, high priority because we can't, we cannot not do it. We have mm -hmm. to work on it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dietz. I'd uh, allow you any closing comments that you'd like to make. Well, I thank you very much for inviting me and good luck with your delab deliberations. And I look forward to working with the provincial government on advancing adaptation actions in the province. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We certainly appreciate your input. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.